Welcome one and all to the Storybox podcast, the place to be if you are a lover of stories. My name is Jay Fanson, former real estate agent, now living my purpose, sharing amazing stories from people all over the world. I'm grateful that you're here today. Now let's journey into the Storybox together and hear more about whose story will be unboxed today. Well, everyone, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome Gabby Reese to the Storybox podcast today. Now, for those of you who don't know who this legend is, she is not only a volleyball legend, but an inspirational leader, New York Times bestselling author, wife, mother. She's married to the, I guess, equally or famous Laird Hamilton, uh, the surfer. The, you are a former professional beach volleyball player and Nike's first female spokeswoman. Uh, you are the definition of both athleticism and beauty. You're the creator of High X, co-founder of XPT, and executive member of Laird Superfood. Gabby is dedicated to building and leading health and fitness methods. You've been featured in so many magazines. You've been on TV, uh, Dr. Oz, you name it. You've been uh, you've done had so many achievements in your life. Gabby, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to Storybox today. Thanks, Jay. And I know it's coming out later, but happy birthday. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. Um, it's an absolute honor to have you here. And the reason why I say that is because you may not have known this, but I've, I've been following your career even in the Olympics and, and just watching you play um, for such a long time. Um, I have one question that I love asking people to sort of start things off. And that is what does success look like to you? You know, I, I get asked, I think, I guess I get asked that question quite a bit. Um, and what I always say, and it's a, maybe an oversimplification of an answer is I always believe that if we can create a life for ourselves as adults, that every day we get up, that at least we're going towards something that genuinely is a representation of who we are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, listen, we all have jobs even temporarily that maybe we don't love, but like it's leading us to this other place that we have in our mind. And so we, it's all part of the plan, right? So it's not, I'm not saying every day is a dream and that we don't have periods of, of life where we're sort of paying dues or, you know, things like that, but that, Ultimately, we have a we have a calling of a sorts that we understand that we're all valuable and have something to contribute. Mm -hmm. And that if we start to at least get in touch with what that looks like, um, I feel like that that is a is really a success. And the other part of that is, and and sometimes it doesn't get talked enough about, is that the relationships we have, whether it's friendships, um, if we are in a partnership, that those reflect us as well, because. You know, when your external life can reflect you as a person, then I think that that means that there's sort of some kind of harmony happening. And um, and that's how I've always looked at it. Like, follow what feels good to you, not uh, maybe what people expect you to do or think you should do or will get you the most attention or the most money. Um, but But like something really inside of you, because then that's when we, like I said, get to contribute our gifts. Mm. I like that. You mentioned there that you've always sort of looked at this definition of success as this way as being relationships and harmony and, and all that. I'm curious, was there like a catalyst moment for you somewhere in your life that sort of made you realize this? You know, I grew up in a way, um, and this is not unique, and I think a lot of young people feel this way, but I did grow up, I didn't at, for a period of time live with my parents from age two to seven, and then I moved back in with my mom. My father had passed away. And I remember as a very young child, like 10 or 11 years old thinking, cause you know, we're sort of subject to living by our parents rule when mm -hmm. we're young, like the way they do it, their system, their approach. And not that that's good or bad. It's just the way it is. Right. And I remember as a young person, very young thinking, Oh, okay. I'm going to choose to do it differently. Like I had a sense of um, it's not about this is good or bad. It's just that this isn't the way I would do it. 
And, um, and then when I was in college playing volleyball, um, I, I started living also in New York and I was modeling and, um, and I was actually, you know, making a living doing that. And I had an accountant when I was 18 in New York. And he said to me, why are you playing volleyball? Like, why don't you make the money when you can? Mm. That was a, a real time of like having to make a decision based on my gut feeling. And the truth of the matter is, you know, I followed the the thing that excited me more and made me feel like more of who I was, which was playing sports. I recognize the opportunity in fashion, but the flip side of that is my career has extended way longer because I followed my gut mm-hmm. um, than, oh, okay, you can work to your 30 or 32. I'm very tall. I didn't fit into everything. If I had done what was expected or chased just the dollar, my career would have been over 20 years ago. Mm. And so I think people have to also look at it like it's important to be calculating and surveying the landscape of your life to be realistic, to kind of understand. Mm. But sometimes it also is you will work harder. You will perform better when you're doing something that you're actually passionate about, which in turn usually means you're more successful. So Mm. even within it, you want to, I'm certainly calculated. So I don't mean that as like, oh, I throw it up in the sky and say unicorn prayers and things like that. There's always a calculation. However, I mean, we can really get it done when we can endure the process. Mm. I, I really like that. So much to unpack there. I have a ton of questions, but one of the things that I'm curious about is this idea of following one's gut and what that actually means and looks like and feels like and why should we actually listen to our gut and what it's telling us? Yeah, well, I think... You know, we're, I'm in the space of just coming from sports and now being, you know, in the in the field that I'm in and Laird's in is like you talk about self-care, health and wellness, whatever you want to call it. And really all the science besides breathing shows about how much of what we experience happens in our gut. Our, you know, you hear people all the time talking about the microbiome, right? Mm-hmm. So I think it's so multi-layered about your gut your quote unquote gut. And that's why, like, even for me, why do I want to exercise and try to eat well? So that if my gut is it kind of in good shape, maybe the signals I'm getting mm. about, oh, this person, this opportunity, maybe that signal's cl- more clear, right? right? And so I think the gut is is nature or nature's way of equipping us with a sense of something that maybe we don't see or we don't know yet but that keeps us, it's like a woman's intuition. These are protective mechanisms or guides Mm. that are given to us to say, you know what, that looks scary or daunting, this this thing, but inside my gut, um, it's saying it's the way to go. And and I think the more we honor that and practice that and practice that in our lives, that instinct, that intuition, um, I think then we believe it more. and, And it usually, not always, but typically I feel like it leads us to the place, you know? Yeah. I think belief is such a powerful thing, especially in today's society. And there's, there are a lot of people out there that do actually struggle with belief. And I know for a long time for me, I struggled with actually listening to my gut and what it was telling me. Like I saw all the signs in front of me, but I, I chose not to listen to them. And then I ended up you know, it was, it wasn't all a bad thing because I ended up learning so much more, which is the beauty of, of uh, life anyway, is even in failure, you learn and the best lessons. Um, so it's not all bad, but I think it's better when you actually follow it in the initial stages. So I guess what I want to ask you to start off with, um, Gabby is what, why modeling? Why did you want to go that direction in the first place? Honestly, it was, it was for work. I moved out of my house at 17 and went to university on a scholarship and I was responsible for myself. So I, you know, listen, you're an underqualified 18 year old girl and they say, Hey, we're going to pay you a weird amount of money to show up and take pictures. I, I could, you know, um, besides my scholarship, I was independent. So I looked at it. I wasn't in pursuit per se of a fashion career. I was in pursuit of, well, this is a really um, fortunate opportunity. And um, I have an opportunity to, to be even more, to be completely independent. Not to mention, listen, you're traveling around the world. You are working with very talented people. And, um, and that's really how I viewed it. It always was a job in the sense of 
I showed up on time. I didn't take it serious in the way of like somehow um, this is important. We're not saving the planet. I, I just always looked at it and I was very grateful for the opportunity that, oh, this is a job. And um, I think I viewed, I mean, even though I loved competing, e even there's a part of me that maybe it's like, you don't want to identify, you don't want to be the thing that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, I think I did that when I was very young, which is like, you know, Laird will say this, he'll say, I, I'm not a surfer, I surf. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that thing of you are who you are. And then in some ways you do these other things. And even when I was modeling, I wasn't like, I'm a model. It's like, no, part of my job is I do this thing. And even in volleyball, it was like, I'm not a volleyball player. I play volleyball. And um, I always had space from those things. I think it's a good distinction between actually saying you are something when it's, I just do that. <laughs> and I think it goes down to your purpose, right? Because oftentimes we think that if we do this or we are this, you know, that sort of impacts our emotional state. And if we, that doesn't actually happen, or if we aren't that, we feel even worse. And I know for me, I wanted to be a filmmaker. So at the age of eight, it was, I'm going to be a filmmaker. Nothing else is going to happen. Guess what? <laughs> Life didn't work out exactly how I thought. You know, I still make movies, but that, does that identi do I identify myself as a filmmaker? Probably not. Yeah. You know, I think it's a very good distinction for a lot of young people that are listening right now to just say, hey, it's okay like, to do many different jobs. To, to, it's all right. Like, life's going to work itself out. But what I want to ask you, Gabby, is, the modeling career, you know, I've heard some pretty nasty things and that goes on. And I've spoken with some models that have actually had to go through it. Did you experience something similar? You know, I was really fortunate. I'm, uh, you know, first of all, I think my demeanor, my disposition, um, I'm, and I'm 6'3", so I'm one, 190, you know, like I weigh 175 pounds. So, and also, um, either I was going to get the job or I wasn't, mm -hmm. and I was going to be professional. I wasn't, I wasn't going to play on the fringe. And if somebody was weird to me, I was going to not, I was going to not get myself into that situation. But again, I think my physical size really protected me. And then coming from sports, um, because where you're, you're, you're more accustomed to being combative, right? Like, mm -hmm. like what are you doing, or, you know, I definitely have photographers say things to me and you'd be like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, like I would say something back. So I was really fortunate. And also I started in New York, not Europe. Mm. So I had, um, you, you know, it's sort of like very businessy there. Yep. So it was, it was kind of hyper-professional actually. Mm. Um, I didn't, I didn't start in Milano or, or Paris. I would go there to shoot, but I was already done it. And, you know, one thing I want to back up to, to remind people Let's say you have a job and, um, you know, the other thing to, to talk about identity that I think is so important is, and I've had this in my own career and, and, and certainly being with Laird for almost 25 years, there's going to be times in your career, like you're busier than other times, mm. right? And sometimes like it's going pretty good. And sometimes it's like, maybe it's not going so good, right? And our value shouldn't go up or down with no. that. And I think that that's, if you say to me at the root of, I need to be who I am as a person. And then I do these other things. Those other things are going to have all kinds of, think about athletes, think about rugby players or footballers from Australia. One year, they're the player of the year. Maybe the next year they hurt their knee. Does that make them less of a person? You know what I mean? Or their value. And I think really, so if you say to me in talking about that last point, that feels to me about the most important thing to drive home to people, which is to remember um, if you know, your paycheck is big or small, you're not more important or more valuable because your paycheck is bigger. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you're, you're not have a diminished value as a human being because it's smaller. Um, those, those things are based on other things. Like what kind of friend are you? Are you working hard? Are you truthful? These are the things in our control. And so I just think it's really important to remind people, um, to place the one self esteem or value in the stuff that's in our power. It's easier said than done. I know that I'm, and I'm older, certainly. Um, 
but I just want to remind people because it's amazing. You could feel like king of the mountain and sometimes you feel, you know, like crap. And so mm-hmm. I think it's really important um, to, to distinguish that. But as far as fashion, I had a very, very good experience in fashion. Mm. I think what I also want to say is what you mentioned there is, is really important. And I like how you brought that up. Even age, I believe age is just a number first and foremost, age comes with experience 100%, but you can also go through a lot at a young age too, um, which I have. And what I've realized is, and what I'll say to a lot of young people from a young person's perspective, what Gabby is saying is 100% true. Like I've experienced that even as 24, like it, it's so true and it's so important to understand. And my other point that I want to make as well is don't compare your identity to somebody else's identity. You are who you were made to be. You've got to ask yourself the hard questions. Why? And always realize this as well. This is something that a friend of mine told me, one of my very first podcasts that sort of blew me away. He said, your purpose is not the destination. Your purpose is just part of your journey. Yeah. I think often, oftentimes young people get stuck with thinking that their purpose is the be all and end all but it really isn't. And I just like how you, you, you summed that up pretty, pretty perfectly. Um, what would you say being a model? We'll get to the, um, the volleyball in a moment because I am curious about that. And, but what would you say was the biggest lesson out of being a model? Mm -hmm. I remember it perfectly Mm. because I was in a dual, you know, life is about uh, duality and tension, right? Like if you think about yin and yang, right? And that is life. Like if you really get into the essence of life, your best feet trait in your personality is also usually anchored into something that is not your best trait, right? Like it's all that tension for all of us. And I was living in an external life two very different worlds. I was in Tallahassee, Florida at Florida State University, uh, sweaty, gross, trying to lift weights and get as big as I could, as strong as I could. And then I was living in New York and doing high fashion and trying to stay slender. And like, it's like a little bit of a dichotomy. And I remember, and I was working in a time where, you know, then they talked to coin the phrase supermodel. That was those days. And so I'll go to work some days and you'd be working with literally the most beautiful women in the world. Like women, like when they say, oh, you can't have an all, like you can't have the face and the teeth and the skin and the body. These girls had it all. Right. And, um, you know, you could feel vibrationally, like some maybe were insecure, or they maybe weren't really happy or robust in their personality. And you'd feel that. And then I would get on a plane and I would go back to school and I would go to practice and I was with girls. Maybe they had a couple of blemishes, maybe they're little, you know, their butts are big cause they're sporty and, um, and they felt really good about themselves and they were robust. And I thought, Oh, okay. So the lesson is being perfectly beautiful is probably not going to solve everything. Mm. And I better figure out um, who, what makes me feel good and strong and powerful. Um, and not also, and also not give that to anyone mm. that somehow, no matter what situation you're in, how do you find the way to make yourself feel okay? Mm. Because you're going to be in many situations in life or modeling is an easy one to say, go to, they could say to me, Oh, uh, you're too tall. Um, we need a girl with lighter skin, whatever the things are that's out of my control. Mm. Right. So how, and we're always going to be in those situations. We're going to want to date someone and they'll say, Oh, I'm that's, you know, I, that's not the way I feel about you, whatever it is. Um, you go for a job and they'll say, I'm sorry, you're not qualified yet enough or what, what, wherever the path takes you. But it's like, how do you find the way within yourself to connect to your own power regardless of the external world. So that juxtaposition at 18, I was like, Oh, Mm -hmm. because given the definition of what life tells us, these girls I was working with in New York should have been perfectly uh, Mm -hmm. happy and feeling confident and out there and like all these things. And uh, I realized that maybe the volleyball girls that were training hard and kind of earning it a little bit and developing a skill set. So if your coach likes you or not, if you can hit the ball straight down, you can hit the ball straight down. Like that's nobody's, you know what I mean? So it's like developing skills. And that's why I always say to people, like, it's really important to try your best to develop some kind of craft Mm -hmm. that is yours to work on, that is yours to improve in. 
upon and yours to empower you. Because if you're waiting for everyone else to tell you, hey, good job, or I want you, that gets bumpy. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine. Imagine. What would you say, having seen all that, what would you say is your definition of real strength as a woman? As a female? As a female. You know, I, I sometimes people, I think they don't always love my definition of it because I've, because I've come from such a highly physical background mm -hmm. and very, I have a, in some ways, emotionally, I'm very masculine. Like I'm, you know, I sort of, uh, analyze things. I don't just have, you know, I'm not so emotionally based. Mm. However, um, I also have really understood the power of choosing to yield. And when I say that there's something about when a woman is, is strong and she knows how to uplift the people around her. So if it's her partner, her children, her friends, um, that is very, very powerful. And I, and people sometimes think, oh, well, I, it, you know, like, let's talk about a relationship for a second. Like, well, if, if a woman tells her partner, for example, let's say she's with a man. Okay. And this has just been my experience. Well, you, you better do this, this, and this. Otherwise, you know, I'm not going to do this, this, and this, or if you want me to do this, this, and this, you've got to do this, this, and that. Right. And typically what you find, and it's not so different with children, it's different because you've got to be an example to children is as a female, what I've learned, I have a lot of power in elevating the people around me with loving kindness. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't mean I'm not strong. It doesn't mean I, I can't leave. It doesn't mean I don't have boundaries. But what I have found, and I had to learn it, was that when I am trying to be my best self, especially in my home or my workplace, and um, someone, let's say they're making different choices, maybe they're not in control of their moods or what have you, instead of jumping, pouncing right away and saying like, oh, I'm going to fix that or you better change that, to actually hang back a little and to keep your frequency high. And what you'll see is you can elevate everybody around you because ultimately, especially usually you're probably in a relationship with somebody that really probably wants to do the same thing. Maybe they're having a hard time getting there. Mm. So what I find as a female is the, the real strength I have because I'm, I'm feel comfortable that I'm not going to be taken advantage of is to be as loving and as, as kind as I can be. And then right behind that is a force that is um, unapologetic and like, you know, I always say like, for example, if you have anyone listening, that's like a female boss, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you do all these other things and then you might have to say, I'm so sorry, that's not going to work. Mm. And so learning both, like I don't have to get angry to have really uncomfortable conversations anymore. When I was younger, you know, you'd finally, I don't know if you've had girlfriends or whatever, they finally go, this is how I really feel. I got, I know how to get there. No problem. And it can be uncomfortable. And someone could be like, Oh, I hate her bitch. Would you shiver period? Like whatever the things they think. And it's like, well, actually, no, I'm the boss right now. And I'm dropping off uncomfortable information. And that's just the way it is. So the love goes in both ways. It also gives you power in a different way where, um, you, you learn to accept, uh, cause you are in love that sometimes people aren't going to like you or they're not going to agree with you or you, or, whatever. And that's okay too. So I think as a female, what I've learned is that duality again is really important. Um, as we get older. Mm. I don't think I've ever heard it really described that way before. I think, that, I think that's really, I like it actually, because it, it, part of that resonates with one of the girls I was dating someone last, not last year, but a year prior Mm -hmm. seven months and she was a latina so she she was like well we well the, what they like to call a firecracker they got angry yeah. i'm not mm -hmm. an angry person at all no. but the way you know she got ang she got more angry at the fact that i didn't react i didn't get angry back but I, yeah she was very much in the sense like you wasn't emotional it was very straight down the line this is what i what i think what i believe that's it. And there's no real emotion to it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think trying to navigate that as a man, 
trying to look at that and trying to say, how can I, I want to help. I want to. Because men want to fix it, right? Because we want to fix it. Mm-hmm. But what I realized in that whole situation was I was doing the wrong thing <laughs> by wanting to fix it is that's not how you go about doing it. Like you just allow them to be them. Yeah. Well, that you just said the most yes. important thing. Yeah. If any relationship, including children, friends, is the space to say, I love you. And I'm, and you know, okay. So I'm married to somebody who less now, but was certainly very emotional. Right. And what I used to finally figure it out that I finally could verbalize was, I appreciate that because that's also connected to like passion, someone who's incredibly loving, all these other things. But what I used to say is when you get into those moods, can it not be you against the world? Can you allow me to be inside your envelope safely? I won't ask you to feel different. I won't ask you to be different. Just let me feel like at least I'm in the envelope. And so it's somehow finding that sweet spot where someone can be exactly who they are, but it's somehow they're not just, you know, exploding shrapnel on you. Cause that's not fair either. Right. So it's like saying, yo, I, I love you. And I know that you're, that's part of who you are. And so how do we figure out a way that this is still done in a really healthy, productive way. Mm. And, um, and I think that's really, really important is if we actually think we're going to change anyone, um, it's, it's not really realistic. It's a really a choice that people will make. And, um, and for us, again, just to, if we, I think, feel like if we're there and we stand there, you get to everything so much, so much better. Mm. Um, but again, I, 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 I've had to, there's so much to learn and sometimes you have to experience it. You grow up with certain ideas and then you get into the real world and then you're in a relationship and you go, oh, wait, this is really different. Nobody <laughs> talks about this stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, but love gives a lot of space. Yes. And so love is important simultaneously, right? It's like, we can't at the cost always of ourselves, Mm. um, love someone. We have to love ourselves simultaneously to loving someone for the way that they are. Oh, that's beautiful. (laughs) I love that. It is so true. But it's a dance. Yeah. I had to learn that the hard way, (laughs) but it was, it was the most beautiful thing looking back on it now of understanding, okay, I did all these things wrong because I didn't understand. I just wanted to control. I was brought up with controlling mother. I wanted to do the same thing. I had all these emotions. I had all these this baggage that I was holding. And when it all sort of ended, you're right. Like I, I had to learn the hard way, but that's okay. I needed to find what real love was for me first. So then yeah. I can now give it to somebody else. Yeah. Well, and, think, yeah. And it's not learn the hard way. It's just learn. Yeah. That's true. Very true. Fortunately, it's usually uncomfortable, but you know, none of us, they didn't, they never tell us about any of this stuff in school or anything. I wish they did. <laughs> It'd be so helpful. But even then, would you believe it? I will, well, at least it would be dropped in. So when I was in the situation, I could reference it like, oh yeah. You know, I've done that like with parenting. You don't know what you're doing when you're parenting. And occasionally I've read a book and sometimes one of the concepts floats and I'm like, oh, that's kind of a good idea for here, you know? Yeah, yeah, very true. Um, Gabby, I want to ask you, how in the world did you meet Laird? Because you've been together for 25 years. How did you meet and how did he woo you? And and like, because you mentioned that he was emotional, you weren't. So how did you end up falling for him? Well, the thing with Laird is I, I don't know that I could help myself, actually. Um, I met Laird. You no, know, it was like a gravitational pull for me. With Laird. I think that's the only way we could probably be together. Um, I met Laird in 1995. I went to interview him. I used to do a TV show. Um, I, was, I did a show with MTV called MTV Sports uh, before you were born. And um, then I had a show called The Extremists. And I would go and interview all these athletes and learn about their training and learn about what they do. And then I would try the neophyte or the beginner's version of whatever sport they had. So at the time, there was eight guys in the world doing this type of surfing called toe surfing. And um, they were doing it at this very large wave called Piahi or Jaws on Maui. And so I went there to talk to one of kind of the people who created it. And it was a surfer named Laird Hamilton. And, and, uh, you know, I would, I wouldn't say Laird was particularly nice to me in the beginning of the interview. He didn't know anything about me at the time. I was 
competing and I was a professional athlete. Um, he thought it was some girl for hire to ask a bunch of questions. And then after the interview, he was certainly a lot nicer. Um, and I think we lived together eight days later. What? <laughs> yeah. I, no, I can't, I can't wait for my daughters to like, be like, well, you guys, it's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, that is a great story. So what happened in that, that eight day period? Like what, what, what did he do? Like, well, listen, I'd never met a person like Laird before in my life. I, and I think then even at 25, I was like, I, I don't know if I'm going to meet someone like this again. And you're, you're talking about one of the most present Mm. humans and also with Laird because of his time in nature. Um, what you see is what you get. And, and see, I grew up in the Caribbean and Larry grew up in Hawaii. So actually what bonds us is, is that we're both from islands. And I think our value systems are very, very similar. Mm. Um, and I find Laird very courageous and not in that way of like, okay, giant waves. I find him brave that he's, he's willing to be himself. Mm. And um, I was certainly not as brave as Laird is like, he just puts it out there. And, um, and he's, listen, I'm not going to lie. He's very, like, I always, somebody said to me once years ago, 15 years ago, Oh, you're married to Laird. That's so cool. And I thought, yeah, it's cool. But what I thought is if all, everything went bad, like the power went out and like the hell and like the world was going to hell is like, that I would have food. Like Laird is a capable person in a very like grounded basic way uh, build something dig a hole plant something kill something if you have to mm-hmm. and I realized that I understood about how to kind of navigate the world mm-hmm. like I could sort of do that like oh we got to get the cable hooked up yeah okay I got that no problem all the civilized stuff and I actually think I was also drawn to him because he's still connected to a very basic way of being that's mm-hmm. actually really to me in my mind like more sophisticated. Mm. And, uh, and I felt like, oh, okay, so that'll be covered. Cause I can't do all that. And, um, and you know, he's, he's really a unique and, and special and, and, uh, and I, I get inspired by Laird. I think that's it too. Is like, I have a partner that, um, he's on a personal quest with, with real genuine passion. Mm. And so living with him is, um, it's not that it's easy because it's not, it's, it, I mean, he's so intense, but I really admire that pureness that he approaches things. Mm. I like that. Um, we haven't even touched on your volleyball yet. Um, okay. But what, what I want to ask you though is I played volleyball in high school and I could have actually gone further with it, but I didn't train. I was more passionate about basketball than I was with volleyball. I was actually trained by a Paralympian. So he was man, yeah. man in a wheelchair and uh, he saw something in me that nobody else really did. And he was intense. Like he was, he was kind, but he was intense. He wanted the very best out of everyone, but he, he demanded the most from me. And I think that was because he saw something that I didn't even see, like the hard work mentality. And he made me the setter. And, um, I was the shortest guy. I'm only five, seven. So, but I could, yeah, very, very small, but I could seem too nice to be a setter. Too nice. (laughs) Yeah, probably. You're you're probably right about that. I actually was a bit too nice, but I could jump and Mm -hmm. I, I just knew where the ball needed to go and I get it there for the spikers. Um, and are you left handed? No, uh, right. right okay. Hand. Yeah. And what about, what, how are you, were you soft blocking? Like with your hands up, and, like, how are you blocking on, uh, the, on the one corners? Yeah. Of your, Cause you just, height, did you go I, flat or how are you? Like this, the, the fingers down. Well, sometimes when the player's smaller, mm. you know, they're ne- they can't really go over cause the hitter's going over them. So a lot of times you'll see sh- smaller players going flat. Yep. When they block, so they can't hit right behind them. Yeah, I think that was That's, me. Yeah, I was yeah. just curious because I used to be able to jump higher than the actual. Uh, yeah. The net. The 
Uh, yeah, of course. And then smash it down. Yeah. Um, and people used to be like, oh, he's, he, he's too short to do that. <laughs> I'm like, I'll, I'll prove you wrong. Like that was my mentality. Yeah. Um, what I want to ask you though, I, I love volleyball. But what I want to ask you is what did you love the most about volleyball? Well, I loved competing and I loved the environment of hard work, weirdly, like with a team. There was something about that where I felt like, oh, I've earned this two or three hours. It's honest, right? Mm -hmm. You've got someone who's willing to tell you, hey, that was good. Hey, that wasn't good. I love the idea of people working together to be greater than they could ever be on their own. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had games that I played where I wasn't so good and I had teammates that would elevate me or, you know, hopefully vice versa. But really, ultimately, at the end of the day, besides the valuable lessons that I believe sport gives you, is um, it gave me a place to belong. Mm -hmm. I think growing up, because I didn't really have a great family situation and because of my height, at a very pivotal time when you're going through puberty as a young lady, Mm -hmm. that it just really gave me a place to belong. And even to the point of like, you know, silly people would say, because I was 6'3 at 15, they'd be like, oh, do you play basketball or volleyball? And if you, and I was like, yes. And then they would be like, oh, that's why you're so tall. And I was like, yep, that's why I'm so tall. So it just gave me that belonging. Mm. Um, so I, I really, I'm an advocate for sport because ultimately at the end of the day, it kind of saved me. Mm. Mm. For sure. Wow. Um, what, what was the toughest game that you ever played? Do you remember? I just think any game that you're, you're physically, like I had knee issues sometimes. So I think it was the games more that like you were nervous or unsure that you were going to be able to trust your body to do what it needed to do or coming back after a surgery. So I don't know that it would be point for point grind. I've certainly, I can remember long games and matches that, you know, maybe you didn't come out the victor, but it was like, you gave everything you had, Mm. but really the toughest ones are the ones where you're like, I'm going to jump now. And I really hope my knee is going to handle this. Kind of yeah. Thing. Cause yeah. You, you do it like games take forever. Like they can go back and forth, back and forth. Um, yeah. Well, and you played during rally scoring. You have to remember when I started volleyball, we were doing side out. Yeah. So if you had somebody who was mentally tough and was not going to shank a pass. So that meant they were probably going to side out. Mm. Uh, you'd be out there a while. Oh yes. I remember, it, I remember those yeah. rallies. Like yeah. they hurt so, your knees. <laughs> you be, and the amazing thing about volleyball that I loved, I guess the most was the, the pure athleticism that you needed to last for such a yeah. long time. Yeah. And I, I just love being, I was always an active kid, but I had my coach on the sideline because you, you wouldn't sub out. He'd keep me in there. There'd be one set. I keep, keep me in there the whole entire game, sub other people out. But yeah. he's like, no, Jay, you're going to be in there for the entire game. Can you do that? And I saw that as a challenge. And I'm like, yeah. 100% I can. And, and if he saw me ever get tired, he'd be like, wake up. And, mm-hmm. he'd like, and if I did a bad, bad set, he'd be yeah. like, what was that? <laughs> and I just didn't want to disappoint him. So I'd be like, okay, next one's going to be better. I promise. Yeah. I love that question. What was that? And you're like, yeah, I know. What was that? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> I'll do better next time. I promise. Like sure. I, I always had that, that mindset of I got to be better and I didn't want to disappoint him, but it was also not disappointing the team, but yeah. also disappointing myself. Yeah. And I think I could have gone like international if given the opportunity, if like for me, like if I had of knuckle down but I don't think I really wanted it I was like there was a tryout between me and four other setters Mm -hmm. and I was I always say this I was beaten by a Frenchman I won't hold it to him (laughs) but he he was actually um he trained more he trained harder and he actually wanted it more than me Mm -hmm. and I always look back at that now Gabby and I think well if I had of where would I be today you know I probably wouldn't be talking to you So, well, I think if you had, you know, the thing about sports and about certain things is you have to really want to, mm because it is so hard. You know, I have a daughter right now in tennis and I'm like, listen, this is your pursuit. 
So if you love it and it's going to, if you think that's what you need to do and you know the difference between people who have it and, and people who don't, and that just might mean maybe you got what you needed and you were then mo- ready to move on to other segments of your life. And remember this too, it's very hard because a lot of times deeper people get into sport, the harder it is also to come out and, and sort of reorganize your life. So it's sort of like looking at it one way or the other going like, okay, was it easy, better for you that you got out early and try new things um, as you're growing and becoming an adult, or is the Frenchman going to get spit out of international volleyball and have to figure out like, who am I at 27 or, you know, there's a million ways to skin the cat. So I think when people have that calling Mm -hmm. it's in them. And by the way, most of the time, I wouldn't say it's fun. It's, it's hard. It's um, satisfying. It's all these things. But if people think like, oh, that's so fun. You, yeah, no, it's pretty tough. And if you ask people who are playing sports of any kind, basketball, volleyball, football, how about footballers that are from one country, they live in another country, mm-hmm. you know, it, there's pressure on you. It's all these things. You better love it. Yeah. Is all yeah. I mean. Mm-hmm. That's a yeah. great point to, to raise. Uh, Gabby, I, I know our time is almost up. So I want to ask you uh, two more questions, if you don't mind. I, I feel like I could talk to you for ages. <laughs> um, this one is my legacy question that I love asking people at the end. So you've okay. been able to reach the age of 100 and your friends have put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how they got it all. We'll call it magic, but they just did. And they've shown it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want? that film to say and to show about your life? I think that uh, truthfully, I I would hope that um, I was an example of somebody who did it their own way and uh, appeared to be in the pursuit of excellence in all the dimensions of life. It doesn't mean I, I, I hit it all the time, but that like when I woke up each day that I really, uh, really tried. And also, you know, I believe this now that I can't be younger than I, than I was yesterday, but I know that in some way I can improve. And, and also that, um, I didn't surprise the people very, very close to me Mm. that I stood tall and straight. Um, you know how, you have people in your life where I would say you have to be somebody who's trying so that you're reminded that there's other people who are trying, mm. right? Like when people, like if you want to be optimistic about the world and the, and life, then you have to be that so that, you know, it's like at least the intention someone's trying. Right. And so my hope would be that I at least am flawed and the people close to me know my flaws and the things that I'm always wrestle with, but that somehow in there, I, I stood always tall for them and loved them and um, and uh, just showed up in that real way. Like never made a weird big left turn, if you know what I mean. Like it's maybe like that coach. Like you've seen certain people in your life where you're like they, they show up in their life every day, mm-hmm. even when they're – it's not their best day. And I think that that would be it. I don't – you know, as far as like some kind of external legacy, that's not for me to dictate. People will glean whatever they glean or nothing at all. You know, like I'm, to be honest, uh, I, for you at your age to know who I am or anything about me is, I think, um, it becomes unusual because usually every, you know, it's sort of like I skew a little bit older. Mm -hmm. So you start to learn like, even that's kind of fleeting. Mm -hmm. So just keep doing the work and see what happens. I feel like I was going to ask you one more question, but I feel like that's a good way to sort of end it. We've definitely got to do this again. Part two. So many more questions. Are you sure? If you have any questions, I will answer. I'm here. I, I would love to ask you more questions, but it's more my bad. I've got another podcast in a couple of minutes, but we've definitely got to do it again. Um, please, if, if you're willing, Gabby, Thank you so much for your time today and and for sharing a little bit about your story um, and for coming on the Storybox podcast. Thank you for having me and getting up so early. And and I appreciate that, you know, you'll remind people just that um, it's their unique journey. So what do they want to do? You know, 